Together with Rossini and Bellini, Donizetti forms the shining triumvirate in the bel canto sky. Immortal figures are due to him, and so Joan Sutherland, Maria Callas and others have helped Donizetti's music to a deserved renaissance more than 50 years ago, and the Italian belongs to the great opera composers. Donizetti did not have it easy in life. All the more, one must acknowledge his artistic productivity. He managed to write the most brilliant comedies, even in his darkest times. Who was Gaetano Donizetti and which people and places influenced him? A biographical approach to the century artist from Italy. Donizetti was born in 1797 as the fourth of six children. His birthplace was Bergamo in northern Italy, where he also spent his entire youth. The Donizettis lived in the so-called Citta Alta, the upper part of the town, which is situated on a hill above the Po Plain. He spent his childhood in poor circumstances. Donizetti's parents were employees of the wealthy aristocrats and lived in underground apartments in the Borgo Canale, outside the city walls, which were assigned to the employees. You can still visit the rooms where the Donizettis lived in the first nine years. The poverty of the conditions is still palpable today. The cellar has only two rooms, a bedroom where the whole family slept and a lounge and workroom. There are another two rooms in the basement, which was used by another family. For his parents, a career as a musician for their son was unthinkable. This circumstance, together with his poor origins, led Donizetti to have an ambivalent relationship with his hometown throughout his life. Thanks to the support of the director of the church music school, the German Simon Meyer, Donizetti received a sound musical education in Bergamo, and the talented Gaetano devoted himself to music. He sold success with operas as a young adult, writing his first work in this genre at the age of 21. His first major success came at the age of 24, with his eighth work, in Rome with the help of Bartolomeo Merelli. Bartolomeo Merelli was a school friend and helped Donizetti out with libretti for his operas. Merelli was a theatrical agent and later became the director of La Scala and is considered not only Donizetti's discoverer, but was later Verdi's first patron. Merelli later worked repeatedly with Donizetti, first as impresario of La Scala and second as director of the Vienna Capitol Theatre. A guest performance brought him to Naples, and the southern Italian city became Donizetti's most important artistic station and he spent most of his artistically productive time there. It was the famous impresario Barbaia who made him an honorable offer. He had become aware of the Bergamasque after first success in a smaller theater of Naples. Barbaia showed courage and installed him as Rossini's successor as artistic director at the famous San Carlo Opera House. There, Donizetti was to produce 25 operas for world premieres in various houses over the next 15 years. Like Rossini, Donizetti also produced for other theatres and toured Italy tirelessly, sometimes to escape Nabel's notorious cholera epidemics. Donizetti lived in various places in Naples, and the block is on a residence where he lived in 1837 at Via Nardones 14. In 1828, he married the 18-year-old Roman Virginia Vaselli. For the first time, Donizetti was truly happy, but the happiness lasted only a short time. A child born a year later died after only a few days, a harbinger of the catastrophe that would befall him 10 years later. But more of that later. Milan actually played a minor role in Donizetti's personal biography, along with Bergamo, Naples and Paris. And yet, the northern Italy metropolis was decisive for the career of the Lombard. In 1830, his international career began there with the triumph of his first masterpiece, Anna Bolena, 
starring the dream couple Giuditta Pasta and Giovanni Rubini. Two years later, he was able to double down at the same place. He presented himself to the Milan audience with Elisir d'Amore. When the opera of the 35-year-old was premiered, Donizetti experienced one of the most brilliant moments of his career. This theatre was the premier venue of his Elysir. Donizetti had written the opera in an incredible 13 days because the theatre needed an alternative at short notice. It is interesting to see Donizetti's autographs of the Elysir because Donizetti wrote out only the vocal lines due to time constraints. In addition, he noted the bass lines to indicate the harmonic progression. To this, he added remarks on how to orchestrate. The copyist then wrote out the parts and completed the score under Donizetti's supervision. During the rehearsals, the finishing touches were made. Hector Berlioz had attended one of the first performances of the opera at the time, and he made some unflattering comments about the theatre business at the time. I had to strain to hear the music above the noise of the audience. People were talking to each other, gambling for money, dining and successfully drowning out the orchestra. Anyway, the ovation of the audience was gigantic. Also the reviews of the newspapers overflowed. Donizetti thus brilliantly confirmed the success he had achieved with Anna Bolena two years earlier. Now he was finally on a par with his friend and rival Bellini and the two became Italy's leading opera composers. Let us return to the comedy L'Elysir d'Amore. On the surface, this comedy is about a satire of the story of Tristan and Isolde. But it was clear to contemporary the theatergoers that the cholera was at play in this opera. It was rampant in southern Italy during those years. Red wine and the Solanum Dulcamara, a nightshade plant, were common remedies in the fight against it. So it's no coincidence that a certain Dr. Dulcamara sells a bottle of wine to the gullible Nemorino, a comedy with a nasty double bottom. Thus Donizetti rose to become the leading opera composer in Italy and all of Europe. Bellini died in 1835, Rossini fell silent in 1829 and Verdi's successful opera was not born until 1843. In 1835, he composed his most famous opera, Lucia de Lammermoor, and with the mad scene, created one of the most famous scenes in opera literature ever. Musically, Donizetti broke new ground. In these years, the tenor had changed to the heroic role. The tenor Gilbert Dupré had sung the Do in petto, the high C from the chest, for the first time in Rossini's William Tell and changed the role of the tenor forever. Donizetti pushed the role further with the roles of Edgardo in Lucia and Poliuto in the opera of the same name, leading to the drama of the death of the famous tenor Adolphe Nouri. Nouri, who sang the high C still from the falsetto, suffered badly from being passé in Paris and tried to realign his voice in Naples. But the attempt to sing the C from the chest failed and he ruined his voice. When Neapolitan censors banned Poliuto, Nuri's hope for a comeback vanished. Donizetti left in a huff and brought Poliuto to the stage in Paris with Dupré in the leading role. It was all too much for Nuri and he called it quits at Palazzo Barbaia in the bustling Via Toledo by jumping out of the window. After his marriage, Virginia had given birth to three children, but all of them were born deformed. This was probably due to Donizetti's syphilis infection, with which he had infected his wife. When his wife died of cholera in 1837 at the age of only 29, and his parents shortly thereafter, Donizetti had reached the lowest point of his life and tried to bury his pain in his work. In 1839 he left Naples for good, enraged that he had not been given a post of director of the conservatory and that his opera Poliuto had been rejected by the Neapolitan censors. He had already begun his campaign of conquest of the French capital four years earlier. In 1835 Donizetti had visited the city for the first time 
at Rossini's invitation, and his works enjoyed growing popularity. His first great highlight in the French capital was his triumph with the French version of Lucia de Lammermoor in 1837. Donizetti then took the city by storm. He began his Paris career at the Théâtre des Italiens, expanded his activities after 37 to the Grand Opera and the Théâtre de la Résistance. And with the Fil du Régiment, he took the fourth and last bastion of the pa Paris opera scene, the Opéra Comique. As a result, Donizetti was able to realize opera projects in all four of the city's opera houses during the 40-41 season. Donizetti was able to write simultaneously in four different styles for each theatre, a true musical chameleon. He had reached the peak of his creative powers and was the greatest active opera composer in the world. His most lasting success in Paris was his Fille du Régiment. The effect that the opera with its patriotic pieces had on the French for decades is astonishing. La Fille du Régiment was for a long time the unofficial national anthem for the French, and for many decades it was the, on the program on the French opera houses on the 14 juillet, and, like the Marseillaise and the fireworks, was part of the national holiday. In 1840, as a celebrated opera composer, he returned to his hometown for a visit that celebrated its son with a gala opera performance, which was among his greatest satisfactions. He was able to celebrate his triumph in this theatre. On the occasion of his centenary, the beautiful theatre was named after the most famous son of the city. In total, one counts 70 operas in his comparatively short compositional period of less than 30 years. Of course, Donizetti's oeuvre also includes mediocre works. To reproach him for the large number would be unfair, because the legal situation clearly disadvantaged the composers. When the works were delivered, the composer had the right to a one-time compensation. The exploitation rights then lay with the publisher or impresario. The protection of intellectual property developed only in the years of Verdi. Donizetti was a freelance composer without any patron in the background. Like Rossini, he had to create two or three works each year to make a living. The prima donnas were much better off, and their compensation was several times higher than that of the composers. Donizetti was in Vienna several times from the 1830s on, sometimes even with official functions with the help of his school friend Merelli who, in addition to La Scala, was also the director of the Kärtner Tor Theatre. Donizetti took care of the Italian program there for two seasons. Among other things, he staged the first Viennese Nabucco, at whose premiere in Milan he was present and deeply impressed. In 42-43, Emperor Ferdinand appointed him K&K &K, Kammerkapellmeister and court composer and even Richard Wagner enviously called Vienna Donizetti's city. Donizetti began to suffer more and more from health problems. His advanced syphilis affected his health more and more, so that the 50-year-old had to be confined for 18 months in a sanatorium near Paris. He was then taken to Bergamo and thus returned 25 years after his departure as a seriously ill and mentally severely deranged patient. In 1848, he died there at the age of 51. His coffin was solemnly escorted to the gravesite three days after his death by three choirs and 400 torchbearers and buried in the cemetery of Altesse. In 1875, his body was taken to the church of Santa Maria Maggiore and led to rest in the church next to the coffin of his teacher, Simon Meyer. Donizetti's tomb is worthy of a closer look. In the upper part, we see the goddess of music with a lyre. She is sad because she can no longer play it, as the instrument has no more strings, because Donizetti died. In the lower part, we see seven children, representing the seven notes. They are disintegrated because they no longer know what to do without Donizetti. <laughs>